Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Of, of Mark. This is going to be a beautiful study in the time of the life of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is a very special gospel. It's special in several ways. The reason I chose this to do at this time is because Mark is the basic chronology for all the other Gospels except John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what are called synoptic Gospels. The word synoptic is a Greek term that means to see together, which means they are a parallel account of the life of Christ. We believe that Mark is the earliest Gospel written sometime between the year 50 and the year 70. To tie it down more than that would be very hard to do. It was, uh, it was written first, we believe, because if you take all three Gospels, like in A.T. Robertson's Parallels, the Gospels are harmony to the Gospel, put them side by side, every verse in the Gospel of Mark, except for 24 little verses, are either included in Matthew or included in Luke. Matthew and Luke follow the chronology of Mark. Matthew sometimes deviates from Mark's chronology, and Luke sometimes deviates from Mark's chronology, but never do Matthew and Luke disagree with, against Mark. So therefore, Mark was probably on the table before both Matthew and Luke when they wrote their Gospels. Mark is a very a vivid account of the life of Christ is an action-packed account. There's not much dialogue in it. There's only one discourse of Jesus in all the Gospel of Mark. Most of the accounts are fast and, and, and vivid, and it's, the, it's almost the appearance of an eyewitness account. And Jesus took him in the crook of his arm, you see, uh, describing what someone would have seen who had been there. We understand from 1 Peter 5, verse 13, that later on, John Mark, who wrote this gospel, became the companion of Simon Peter. And the gospel of Mark follows exactly the outlines of the sermons of Peter that are found in the early chapters of the book of Acts. So what we have is Mark writing down Peter's eyewitness account. There are several things listed in the introduction about who John Mark is. I have left one out that I want to mention to you. In Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52, the setting is the Garden of Gethsemane. And we have a little, couple little phrases that say, And a young man wearing only a linen tunic was following after Christ. And they seized him, but he pulled away and ran away naked. Now, this is the only gospel that records this. And because it's the only gospel that records this, many of us believe that that young man was John Mark. He was with the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, like the rest of Jesus' followers, except for John, uh, were terrified, and as they tried to grab him, he ran. We also find an account of John Mark. If you'll look under number three, under the author, if you'll include this scripture that he was a co-worker with Paul, if you'll include Philemon, verse 24. Philemon, verse 24. The readers of the gospel, if you look down under, under that section in your introduction, is probably Gentile Christians, most especially Romans. Now, whether it's, the, it's in Rome or simply a Roman colony that he's writing to, we don't know. Matter of fact, the only Old Testament, direct Old Testament quote found in all the gospel of Mark is the one that's in our text for tonight, found in the first chapter. Mark does not quote the Old Testament a lot because Mark is writing to Gentile believers who would not know or understand the Old Testament. So therefore, it's a gospel trying to show the vividness and the excitement and the power of the person of Jesus Christ, okay? So, the style of Mark I've mentioned to you, and I think we'll begin now in the gospel itself. I have quite a bit to cover tonight. I hope I don't go too fast. I know that I do go uh, awfully fast some time to write down and for you to comprehend all this. Uh, Margaret Rogers makes a copy of all these. Everything preached in this pulpit, Margaret has a copy in the library. And you may check these tapes out as library books uh, kind of situation for a week. Every Bible study I've done is in the library to be checked out. 
If I go too fast for you, you go back during the week and check out that copy and go a little bit slower with a tape recorder where you can get the references down and the full inference and connotations of the Greek words that we talk about. Beginning of the good news. The word good news or gospel is a word that means glad tidings. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. The of here is a very special kind of construction in Greek, which means the good news concerning Jesus Christ, not the good news preached by Jesus Christ. So what we have is the gospel concerning Jesus Christ. The word Jesus is a translation of the Old Testament titles Joshua and Yahshua. Now, next time somebody knocks on your door and tells you the name of God is Jehovah, would you please remind them that there are no J's in Hebrew? There is no such thing as the city of Jerusalem. There is no such thing as the man called Joshua. There is no such thing as Jehoshaphat and Jehu and all the rest. There are no J's in Hebrew. There is a Y. It's Jerusalem, Yahshua, and on and on. So anyway, simply say, the word here for Joshua, Yahshua, Yeshua, simply means God is salvation. What an appropriate title for Jesus Christ. It's exactly what the angel told them to name this child. God, Yahweh, is salvation. The word Christ is a word that comes over into Hebrew, uh, from Hebrew into Greek. It's the Hebrew word uh, Messiah. That means the anointed one. It comes into Greek as the word Christ. So it's saying uh, salvation is of Yahweh the Messiah. Now that's who we're talking about. We're talking about God's Messiah, his special anointed one that he himself has sent for the purpose of salvation. All that in Jesus Christ? Yes, it really is. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, the word written is a perfect tense in Greek which speaks of something that happens in the past with result, results that abide in the presence. This is my theory of the Word of God. It's saying it stands written in Scripture. It is the, the Bible's way of expressing that the Scripture is once and for all given to God's people. It's a way of saying the promises of God are eternally valid. It's a way of saying uh, this world may pass away, but the words of God will last forever. The Bible... Once delivered to the saints is forever. Now, it stands written in the prophet Isaiah. Now, the Old Testament stands to the New Testament as promise to fulfillment. Promise to fulfillment. Now, the Gospel of Mark is going to begin with the life, not of Jesus, but of John the Baptist. Notice the quotes. Now, it says the prophet Isaiah, and part of this phrase does come from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. But the majority of it comes from Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the first phrase of this Old Testament quote says, Here, I send my messenger ahead of you. Now, there are two possibilities where this came from. The word angelos, or messenger, is the very same word for angel. So it could mean, I send my angel before you, which is an exact quote from the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 20. And that may be what he's referring to. But since he's talking about John the Baptist, it probably the same quote is used in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, about that God is going to send the prophet Elijah before the coming of the Messiah. Now, the second phrase, he will prepare the way, is definitely for Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Now, I want you to notice something about Old Testament quotes in the Gospels. I have a theory in my own heart not very widely held, <laughs> but that um, the Old Testament quotes, when it mentions a phrase in the Old Testament, like it says, prepare ye the way for the Lord, that it's the New Testament writer's way of locking into a context in the Old Testament and not simply one or two phrases. As you know, they, did not, they could not say, turn to chapter 40 of Isaiah verse 3, for there were no chapter divisions at all in the Old Testament and no verse divisions. So, it, to me, when they said, when they quote this about, I will send my messenger before you, they want you to look at the entire context that's being spoken of in the prophet Isaiah. Now, beginning in chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah, it's what we know as the servant songs of Isaiah, which culminates in the beautiful expression of Jesus Christ's death for us, found in Isaiah 53, but going clear through possibly Isaiah 64, which is a few chapters longer than most folks will take it but I think it does to Jewish understanding. Therefore, he's saying, look at the context. 
But if you look at the Old Testament context for most of these quotes, you'll find the New Testament writers are, uh, seem to feel the freedom of combining Old Testament quotes and of taking quotes out of context. Now, he quotes part of this, Prepare ye the way for the Lord. But if you'll read Malachi 3, verse 1, you'll see the rest of the verse has nothing to do with Jesus Christ's life. The rest of verse 1 in Malachi 3 says, And the prophet will suddenly appear in the temple, referring to the prophet that's going to prepare the way. Now, this was the Jewish understanding of the way the Messiah was going to appear. He was going to suddenly appear in the temple on some high and holy day. So you see what Jesus did and why it's so hard to interpret the Old Testament dogmatically, literally, is that Jesus seemed to pick out passages within specific context and pick out part of those passages that apply to him and let other parts go right by the board. And a good example is Malachi 3. There was a prophet, John the Baptist, who was said to be Elijah in the Old Testament that came to prepare the way of the Lord. But uh, John the Baptist did not appear suddenly in the temple. He didn't ever go to the temple that we have recorded, but he was out in the wilderness. Therefore, just part of that Old Testament prediction was fulfilled in the life of John the Baptist. And we've got to be very careful not to force the New Testament to follow exactly the context of the Old Testament. Now, when it says, He is a voice of one shouting in the desert, that's Isaiah 40, chapter 3, the beginning of the servant songs. Now, when it says the desert, every time in this next little passage it says desert, Please don't think of the Sahara and blowing sand and camels and cactus. This, the word desert, is mentioned here as an uninhabited pasture land. We don't know that Jesus went out there in that rugged territory northeast of the Dead Sea. We don't know that he went way out there in that craggy, rocky thing. It simply says he went to the desert. And the connotation of the words here are an uninhabited pasture land, but has grass. So... Uh, I think we have a misconnotation about the fact of what the wilderness is or the desert, okay? Now, when it says, get ready the road for the Lord, make the path straight for him. Now, this, of course, goes back. These are both imperatives, commands. And what it says is it make a highway ready. Now, in the Old Testament context, it says knock down the mountains, fill up the valleys and all that. That's not what it's talking about here. This is used in a metaphorical sense. It's used in prepare the hearts of the people for the coming of the Messiah and not in the Old Testament sense of make the road level for the coming king. So the Old Testament context is the arrival of a royal messenger or a king going on a visit. The New Testament connotation, they change the meaning to, to say it, it's simply a spiritual preparedness and not a literal road making. The Bible does this all the time. But if we're too literal about it, we miss all these figurative expressions that the Bible uses. Now, notice if you would please, when it says, For the Lord, this is possibly the only place, now listen good to this, this is possibly the only place in all of the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is referred to by the term Lord. Now in chapters like 8, verse, chapter 7, verse 28, He's referred to as Lord, but it's in the, in the way of being Mr. or Sir. It's a polite term. It's not the theological concept of Jesus being God's Son. The only other place in the whole Gospel of Mark where this could possibly refer to Jesus as being divine is Mark chapter 12, verse 36, which is a quote of Psalms 2, which says, And David said to my Lord, sit down, how's that thing go? David said to the Lord, sit down at my Lord's feet, or something like that, very close. He uses two words for Lord. He's speaking of God with one, and he's speaking of the Messiah as the other. Now, there's two possibilities of where this thing comes from. This could come from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, or it could come, possibly again, from that royal psalm. Now, we're going to find the same thing a little bit later when he says, You are my son. Now, that definitely is a quote from, I, from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, or it could possibly be from chapter... 42, verse 1 of Isaiah. Now, what Jesus is going to do in this very early part is combine the suffering servant with the messianic king. Now, let's go to the next little section, okay? John the baptizer appeared in the desert and was preaching a baptism conditioned on repentance to obtain the forgiveness of sins. John the one baptizing. This is the usual word for baptizing. It means to put something into... Uh, 
I get so tickled at us. We read this and we say, Proof that John the Baptist baptized by immersion. Uh, at seminary, those of you who've been there, if you go in the library at Southwestern Seminary and you go up the second floor of the library, right in the middle of the stairwell is a picture of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. And Jesus is standing there and John the Baptist is standing there and John is sprinkling him. I thought, what a picture to be in a Southern Baptist seminary. The problem is we just don't know. Can I admit that? We, passages seem to imply immersion. Because of the beautiful symbol of death and burial and resurrection, I think immersion is the true symbol. But friends, you just can't go around beating Methodists over the head saying, we're close to the New Testament. You just can't do it. I'm sorry. I've tried it. <laughs> they won't let you. <laughs> now, when it says preaching a baptism, the word preaching here is a word that speaks of a herald. Now, the word herald doesn't mean anything to me, but if, if uh, Carter sent someone out here, an official mission, to say something to Lubbock, Texas, uh, as an official representative of the President of the United States, that man would be heralding the message of the President. John the Baptist is proclaiming as an official representative of the kingdom of God the message of the kingdom. He is heralding, not preaching, heralding the kingdom of God and the baptism. Now, there's a real fight here between uh, us and our brothers in the Church of Christ on a baptism conditioned on repentance. Now, Williams is very interpretive. Williams taught Greek at Southwestern for years, and so Williams gets a Baptist interpretation. A baptism conditioned on, right? Now, the word here in Greek is the word ice. It's the word usually translated for. One time I want to hit you with something heavy. This is a... This is what's called an authority in Greek syntax. This is a Bayer and Gingrich. And I want to show you the number of ways that this one Greek preposition can be translated to show you the complexity of the situation. It's not exactly who's right. It's what glasses you wear. Now listen to me as I just read you the number of ways this one little Greek preposition can be translated. First of all, it can be the place to place something into, in, toward. It can mean into toward after verbs of going or those that include motion toward a place. With verbs of sending, motioning, which result in movement or the inclusion of a movement, it can mean to, into, or among. It can mean in the vicinity of or near. When used in the nearness becomes actual contact, it can be translated on or in. Uh, it can also denote simply direction toward something. It can be an implication of time, like to the end. It can also mean for or on when something happens. Anxious for tomorrow, anxious on tomorrow. It can indicate the duration of time for many years. In addition to the place and time, it can be used to indicate degree fully, completely, absolutely. It can indicate a goal, purpose of something happening. The results of an action or condition, into, to, so, that. It can denote purpose in order that, to. It can denote reference to a person or thing, for, to, with respect to, with reference to, fit, suitable for someone. It can mean, contra it can have a controversial usage. The reason it's controversial, this dude, he's not a Baptist. <laughs> anyway, it can have the controversial use of because of, and I got two references to quote. Now, when you got two references, that makes it a little more strong and controversial to me. And they are, of course, parallel. Mark, Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, Luke chapter 11, verse 32, and possibly Romans 4, verse 20. And every one of these contexts, the context here is they came preaching to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented, and your translation probably has, at the preaching of Jonah. But as you can see, the word because of the preaching of Jonah is just as good as the word at the preaching of Jonah. So the word ice can mean because of. It can also mean about 300 million other things. Now, for us to get dogmatic about the word ice means for is ridiculous. I'm going to leave this here. You just come by and try to read that thing. <laughs> I left out about 50 of them. So, we can't be dogmatic. I have, I base my understanding on my, uh, I base what I translate here on my understanding of the whole Bible. I think that baptism is extremely important and that we as Baptists have made too little of it. I think Church of Christ has helped us to see again that baptism is extremely significant and the New Testament knows nothing of unbaptized folks. Zero. 
You didn't have a choice about being baptized. If you were a believer, you were baptized, period. So we have taken it a little loosely. Matter of fact, we've taken the Lord's Supper the same way. Now, when we just write it off as being symbolic and doesn't really, you know, just can here and there to make a difference, we are really ripping up some New Testament context. So, baptism is significant. But I don't believe that baptism is the means by which we get forgiveness. I believe, because of my understanding of the Bible, that baptism is a symbolic expression of forgiveness that comes not by baptism, but by repentance and faith. Now, notice again the context here. He preached a baptism conditioned on repentance. The word repentance means to change one's mind, very literally. It means from walking towards self and sin and your own ambitions and then becoming convicted of your sin and your selfishness and your rebellion against God. It means about faith and facing God's will and God's purpose. It's not where you are in relation to how close you are. It's where you're facing. What is the orientation of your life? You, yours, God, His. So this forgiveness was conditioned on, according to Williams, and I like that, repentance. And then notice it says, to obtain the forgiveness of sins. Now, Jesus Christ several times said, I want to show you that I do have the power to forgive sins. And Mark chapter 2, verse 10, excuse me, Matthew 2, 10, is a good example of the fact that he is going to say, I have the power. Now, John doesn't know this yet. John is basing his forgiveness of sins not on the blood of Christ. John, this may be real good, John the Baptist did not have a Christian baptism and John the Baptist was not proclaiming the Christian message. Now, you hear me? He was proclaiming a Jewish message. It's why he's called the last of the Old Testament prophets, the greatest man born of woman. But he is not a Christian preacher. He has never been a Christian preacher. He is simply an Old Testament preparatory voice for the Christian message. John the Baptist's baptism is not the baptism of Jesus or the church. Now, uh, the word forgiveness is a word that means to put something away. Now, isn't that a beautiful thing? Did you ever know the English word forgiveness comes from a Greek word that means to put something away? Now, what are we putting away? Our sins. On to Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Now, notice in verse 5, the, all the people of Judea and everybody in Jerusalem. Now, does that mean every single person in Jerusalem... It's just a way of talking. You talk like that. You know, we talk like that. Everybody came. Everybody didn't come. A whole bunch of them came. That's what it means here. A whole bunch of them came. And a whole bunch of them kept coming. Because the next phrase says, they kept on going out and they kept on being baptized. These are imperfect tense in Greeks, which speak of continuous action in past time. The Greek present tense speaks of continual action in the present and in the future. The imperfect tense speaks of continuous action in the past. Over and over and over again they kept coming out. Many kept coming out. Time after time. Not the same ones, but different multitudes kept coming out to John. Now, and they kept confessing their sins. Now, what does the word confess mean? We get so ripped up in verses like 1 John 1, 9, and we say confess our sins. We think that means feel terribly sorry and get down on our knees and weep and cry. And, and, and That is not at all what the word confess means. The word confess literally means to say the same thing as. It means simply to agree with God that you've sinned. It has nothing to do with this, this uh, you know, uh, it has nothing to do with the idea of penance. Nothing to do with I've got to live better, I've got to give more, I've got to do more, or God won't forgive me. Jesus says, if you'll just agree with me that you're out of my will, I'll cleanse you from it. Just agree. Say the same thing as. Baptism in the New Testament was there walking the aisle. Their public profession of faith. You cannot be baptized without giving a profession of faith. That's why baptism is so important. It was their way of coming into the kingdom of God. They made a public declaration of their faith in Christ before they were baptized. Now, uh, notice it says John wore camel's hair. Now, I've always thought in my mind that what John wore was camel skins. Have you thought that? I always thought that John the Baptist was a guy who just dressed in leather, you know, camel leather. But after studying this and comparing it with Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, what John the Baptist wore was a, cl was a cloth kind of thing out of woven camel's hair. The word hairs is the plural here, which implies it's a woven garment. So 
He was a rough old boy. Can you imagine how? You think wool's bad? Golly, you ought to try camel's hair with no t-shirt. Woo! <laughs> well, anyway. The reason he wore camel's hair, I think, is because he's trying to identify with Elijah. Now, why would he want to identify with Elijah? Elijah is the one who the Old Testament says is going to come before the Messiah, and that's what John the Baptist sees himself to be. And you see that several times in Malachi. Malachi, I think, 3, 5, Malachi 3, 1, Malachi 4, 5. It's where it mentions it. Now, back in 2 Kings 1, 8, it talks about Elijah being dressed this way. Okay? So he's identifying in the people's mind with the prophet Elijah. Now, notice when it says that he ate locusts and honey. <laughs> Golly! This has got to be dried locusts because, boy, locusts are bad at best when they're dried. But, well... Leviticus 11.22 is the Old Testament background for locusts being clean animals. I just don't understand how shrimp can be dirty if locusts are clean, but I'm not going to argue with it. Anyway, verse 7. He kept on preaching the following message. After me there is one... Is your translation have the one capitalized? Does it? Now, usually I've told you that the Old Testament and the New Testament, the original manuscripts, do not have capital letters. If they do, they're all capitals. Now, the reason this, this is correctly uh, translated with a capital letter is because the definite article is here. It's the one that's coming. Now, the one is the Messiah, so it should be capitalized. The one who is stronger than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, apparently their shoes had one central location that you tied it. Now, this was a slave's duty to untie these sandals. Notice that John is putting himself in a submissive relationship to Jesus Christ. Now, here is a good controversial passage. And I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now, what is in water symbolized? I think in water is a ceremonial type of which spirit baptism is the essence. Now, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Romans 6, 3 and 4, and 2, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 defined what I believe spirit baptism is. Spirit baptism is nothing less than the Holy Spirit taking a believer and placing them into Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit baptism is the inclusion of lost people because of their repentance and faith into the body of Christ. Holy Spirit baptism has nothing to do with spiritual gifts. It has nothing to do with ecstatic utterances or, or signs of the Holy Spirit. It is a positional thing of once you were in the world, in self, and now because of your repentance and faith and the wooing of the Holy Spirit, you are placed into Jesus Christ. I believe that's what it's talking about. Now, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. And, you know, it was kind of like they, the rabbis would say, does anything good come out of uh, Galilee? <laughs> I guess Galilee, Galilee, I don't know what part of Texas you don't like. If there's some part of the United States you don't like, that's where Galilee would refer to. <laughs> that was like saying, this guy is from the sticks, I want to tell you. And if I didn't live here, I might think that blowing dust was bad. But since I do, I wouldn't say this was that. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 say, A great light has come out of Galilee. This is prophetic. Friends, Jesus didn't begin in Galilee because he just said, I like Capernaum, got nice streets, you know, they keep the sewers clean. No. It's Old Testament prophecy. A light has shone out of Galilee. These were conservative Jews, but not linked to the orthodox tradition of Jerusalem. So, Isaiah 9 uh, speaks about where Jesus was coming from. And was baptized by John the Jordan. If John's baptism is a baptism of, of uh, conditioned on repentance, what in the world is Jesus doing being baptized? If John kept saying these guys, I'm not going to baptize you till your life shows that you've repented, why is Jesus being baptized by John? You ever thought about it? Now, in Matthew chapter 4, we have, have a, a, the account that John, excuse me, Matthew 3, 14 and 15, John says, I can't baptize you. Godly, I, I can't do it. And Jesus says, we must fulfill all righteousness. So Matthew understands the problem and adds a little phrase there about this is not right. Now, there are some several theories, I think. I'm going to give you four of why Jesus was baptized. Now, these are theories. No biblical authority whatsoever. Theories. We're never told. Number one, as an example. 
Number two, to identifying with the sinfulness of mankind, identifying with sinful lost mankind, though he did not need to. Number three, his ordination and equipment. As you know, the baptism of Jesus was his traumatic moment of beginning his public ministry kind of thing. That was when Jesus really got about the work of, of being the Messiah, was the baptism. That was almost his ordination service, if you please. His equipment by the Holy Spirit. Now, he had the Holy Spirit all along, but it was his equipment, total equipment. I think, really, it was more for the people who were there than it was for Jesus. Now, my, the last one, which I like the best, is I think it's a symbol of his redemptive work for man. Jesus being baptized in a baptism uh, supposedly to forgive sin. Now, that to me, it just smacks of 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which says, And God took him who knew no sin to become sin, that we might become the righteous of God in him. I think it's symbolic of his whole redemptive plan of taking the place of the sinner. But that's just my opinion, and that don't go for much. Now, beginning in verse 10 and 11, we have the Trinity here. This is one of those beautiful passages. People fight the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity. The Bible does not ever use the word Trinity. But an example like this, we've got Jesus Christ being baptized. We've got the dove in a symbol of a, we've got the Holy Spirit in a symbol of a dove coming down from heaven. And we've got God the Father speaking out of a cloud. Now, friends, if Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is a person and not an influence, you've got three aspects of God. Now, we believe in one one, one, one God, not three, one. So what we've got here is some kind of division of labor, some kind of administrative direction. We have a unity of personality, but three separate functions. Very difficult to try to explain. The best way I know how, which is not good, to Peggy, I am a husband. To Jason and Michelle, I am a father. To you, I am a pastor. I am the same person. I don't change that much, hopefully, from home to here. So I am the same person with the same personality, with the same characteristics, but I function in different personal relationships. Now, notice, if you would, please, that the heavens split like a garment they split. This is exactly, exactly the quote of Isaiah 61. Is it not? No, it's Isaiah 64, so it isn't. <laughs> Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that thou would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at thy presence. And on and on it goes. Beautiful passage there in the servant songs of Isaiah. So this is a fulfillment of the servant songs. This wasn't done out just some kind of, well, let's let God the Father come down and make it real dramatic. No! This is Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled in the commissioning of God's Son. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Right over that, the heavens were split. And the Spirit came down like a dove. Now, have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit is symbolized in the form of a dove? Number one, for a Jew to symbolize any part of God with an animal is heresy. God is totally different from animals. That's why the Canaanite religions are so down on, you know, that God is a bull, God is a goat. God is just against that kind of thing. So why symbolize the Holy Spirit as a dove? Some say it goes back to Genesis chapter 1 where the Spirit of God brooded over the waters. Brooded is a, is a, is a bird's word. <laughs> It means fluttering right over the top. Something goes back to, to Noah sending the dove out of the ark. If you know rabbinic Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, the symbol of a dove is the symbol of Israel, the nation of Israel. I think the reason that, that God came down in the form of a spirit to rest on Jesus is that it is, a, it is a, a way of showing that Jesus is the fulfillment and perfect type of the Old Testament saints. He is the epitome of all that God wanted man to be if man could keep the law. But man couldn't, but Jesus did. So I think the symbol of a dove is speaking about Jesus, not so much about the Holy Spirit. Now, notice it says, I have the word, the dove, to enter him. Guess what preposition this is? <laughs> the word I. Unto, in, among, with, by, golly, just keep on. Now, the word into is dumb because I don't think that Jesus didn't have the Holy Spirit and now he's got the Holy Spirit. This is more for the men watching than it was for Jesus, just like when the voice spoke out of heaven and Jesus says, this is not for me that this voice spoke, it's for you. The same with the dove. I don't, I don't think Jesus got the Holy Spirit here. I think he always had the Holy Spirit. But I think it's a beautiful Old Testament fulfillment of guess what section of Scripture? 
Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of God is upon me, same word in the Greek translation, because the Lord has anointed me, that's the word for Christ, to bring the good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to free the prisoners. That's the exact word that Jesus, the section that Jesus read in the synagogue. That's the exact message that Jesus sent to John the Baptist when John the Baptist doubted if Jesus was the Christ. So what we've got here is, again, the fulfillment of the servant song passages in the life of Jesus Christ. Now, the you see the voice? I need about ten minutes to finish. And if I break the context here, I can't start where I need to next Sunday night. So just give me about ten minutes, please. Maybe not that long. Notice when it says, uh, You are my son, my beloved, in you I am delighted. This can come from Isaiah 42.1. Now that is the section that deals with the servant suffering servant songs of Isaiah. It also can come from Psalms 2, verse 7. I think on purpose this quote is ambiguous. Psalms 2, verse 7 is the royal messianic psalm that God delivers the kingdom to the Messiah. Isaiah 42, 1 is the suffering servant song, dying on behalf of many. By his stripes we are healed. And somehow quoting this ambiguously, the gospel writer is combining the royal aspect of the Messiah with the suffering aspect of the Messiah into one combined figure, Jesus Christ. Now, in Judaism, this voice out of heaven is known as a bath coal, but it's not really identified here because a bath coal was really used, it was, a, it was an egotistical thing in Judaism to prove your point. Well, God spoke to me last night and told me so-and-so. By the way, there's a lot of that going on today. Now, notice if you would please when it says, And the Spirit drove him out into the desert, verse 12. The Spirit, not the devil, the Spirit of God, and the word drove... This is the Greek word for thrown out, expelled, rejected. It's the same word that's used in chapter 1, verse 34 and 39 for casting out demons. The Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Now, whether it's the Dead Sea or this uninhabited pasture land, I'm not sure. And notice he stayed there 40 days. Now, the 40 days is not meaning Start at 6 o'clock in the morning, count 40 days, and at 6 o'clock that morning you're loose. No! The word 40 in Hebrew is a symbolic representation for an indeterminate period of time. Just get your concordance, look up the word 40, and see how many times it's used specifically. Tear in the wilderness, Moses on Mount Sinai, Jesus in the wilderness. Oh, it's used numerous times in the Old Testament. It's an indeterminate long period of time. They didn't have watches, you know. Now, Notice what it says, and he was being tempted. Now, the word being tempted is present tense, which means he is continually being tempted. Now, Matthew and Luke record several temptations, but those several temptations that those two gospels record are only the last temptations in a, in a long period of time series of temptations. All that Jesus was tempted, we don't know. We just have the last few. And, and Mark just skips over it real quickly. The word tempt here, there's two words in Greek language for tempt or test or approve, that kind of thing. One word for tempt or test is always used for Satan, sometimes for man. It's mean to test someone with a view of smashing them, breaking them, destroying them. Another word for test or, or try or tempt is the same one in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, you see. It's the word that speaks the fact that God leads us into a testing time not to destroy us but to approve us, to burn off the dross, to uh, purify the essence of our faith. So this is the word for to destroy. The devil was trying to destroy. Now notice it's by Satan. I believe in a personal force of evil that's out to thwart God's plan in man, in his world, everywhere he can. Now, whether it's psychological or not, I don't think it is, but we'll deal with that when we get to Matthew or Luke. Mark just skips over it very quickly, so I'm not going to deal with it here. When it says he was with the wild beast, that symbolized one of two things. The wild beast only lived in uninhabited areas, so it may simply be another way of saying an uninhabited desert or pasture land. But it also refers in the Old Testament time and time and time again that the uninhabited places were the realms of demons. Aziel is a good example in Leviticus 16. Now, whether it's saying that Jesus was in the haunt of demons being tempted and all that by them, or whether he was an uninhabited area, is, I'm really not sure. Notice when it says the angels continued to wait upon him. In there is a real correlation between the first part of Mark 
and Israel in the desert for 40 years, in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, as the angels ministered to Israel in the desert for 40 years, so the angels continually, present tense, continually minister to Jesus in his temptation for 40 days. There is a real correlation between Jesus being the ideal Israelite. The fulfillment of all that God wanted to do in the nation of Israel is culminated or fulfilled in the person of Christ. I'll stop there. I'll do 14 and 15 next time. I have time for a couple of questions. I'm sorry it's taken so long tonight. Introduction was a little long. Any questions about the Gospel of Mark? Yes. Well, I think it's... Read the whole phrase for me there. The Spirit descended upon him as a dove. Now, the word upon is the one I'm talking about. Descended is... I would have coming down. It's, there's no real meaning there. It's the word upon. King James, New American Standard has the word upon. Williams has the word into. It's just this preposition ice. <laughs> so they can really mean a whole bunch of things. I think upon is better or came to him instead of into him. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's the word, it's the word ekbalo, to cast something out, throw it away. I mean, it's a strong word. It, it's like casting the garbage out. It is very strong. And throwing it as far as you can throw it. It's a terribly uh, emotional packed word. The Spirit cast him out into the wilderness. Yes. No, they use words like led into. A <laughs> very nice, calm word. Mark is the first gospel, if it is. Uh, I think Mark's probably an eyewitness account. And probably what, and really what Peter saw was, he saw Jesus come out of the water. And he saw Jesus immediately recognized the burden of his ministry and he saw Jesus run into the wilderness and he says, cast out. Now realize that every one of these temptation experiences the devil was tempting him is how to use his messianic power to redeem the world. So I think finally the great burden of how to do what God called him to do was on him and I think he ran from the presence of men and Peter being there says he was driven, you know. I think so. Wasn't Peter one of the disciples of John the Baptist? Or Andrew's brother? Yeah. So, it, it sounds like an eyewitness account to me. And uh, someone was there told him about it. Not Peter. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Next week we'll do 14 through the end. I hope you'll be reading the Gospel of Mark. I hope you'll buy a commentary. The best commentary, I think, that will help you that is brief but concise is the Tyndale Bible Study Series. You can buy it for about two ninety five dollars a volume at the uh, Winston's. It's a little bitty black. You might get it somewhere else. <laughs> a little black book. It's in paperback. The Gospel of Mark. Now, you need some commentary to follow along. That is a real easy one. Uh, and I think it would be very helpful for you to get that. Let's pray. Could we please? Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come tonight and begin the study of your life. We are so excited about the way you're going to speak to us about our lives today in Lubbock as we look at your example, God. We, we thank you for teaching us by your Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to study and help us to pray as we seek your will out of this book. We thank you for John Mark, I guess, God, because... He's the kind of man we can identify with, a kind of man who gave up and yet came back to make it. We thank you, Lord, for our time together for the next several months. We pray that Jesus Christ might be glorified in all that we do in our study. Lead us, we pray, and guide us. May our church be pleasing to thee, and if not, whatever it takes to get us right, we pray for that. In Jesus' name, amen.